We are human, don't you know, just like you are. I'm Richard Woods, HR business partner turned HR coach. And in this series, I explore the technicolor spectrum that is life in HR with folk in the know. Those that have been there, bought the t-shirt and I'm happy to share their experiences for all of us to benefit. So grab a cuppa, get comfortable and we will crack on. This episode, I'm delighted to welcome Anthony Ernesto. Now, he is the Chief People Officer for a company called Suzy. We'll get more on that later, I'm sure. He's an author, fellow podcaster, and a leading expert on culture, HR, and talent in the USA, and proudly brings design thinking principles to the world of HR. He's also the founder of Ella Adventures, which I found incredibly interesting. Um, that produces a comic book that encourages young girls into the world of STEM and entrepreneurship. And now I could go on a lot because there's a lot of stuff that Anthony's done in his lifetime, but we got chatting a little while ago about Gen Z or Gen Z, depending on which side of the Atlantic you happen to be listening from, and the things HR should consider for strategic workforce planning, talent retention, development, all sorts of stuff. So that's where this discussion starts after a big weird humor welcome to you. Anthony, hello. Hello, how are you? Thank you I'm very for having well. me today. It's great to have you here. And I know we had a bit of a chat before about all this stuff, but it's really good to have this on and share it with the listeners of We're Human and get it more widely talked about. I think because there is a bit of a, a curiosity in the veil hanging over this generation and beyond and the generation we're about to talk about. But before we get into that, I do ask all of my guests to give me a little bit of insight into what brought them into the wonderful world of HR in the first place. So what's your story? Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a long one, but we'll we'll try to we'll try to make it brief. The abridged uh, version, was, maybe. I, <laughs> the abridged, right? I was going to say Reader's Digest. I don't know if oh. that uh, if that uh, is is generational or even worldwide, but. Um, but I, I think it's like most HR folks, a bit accidental. So I studied accounting in college and uh, because my dad said, if you take accounting, you'll always find a job. People always need accountants. Of course, he was an accountant, so that made sense. Uh, took accounting. Uh, four years of it kind of trudged through it. I wasn't really super excited about it. Then got a job in accounting. And after a year... Uh, realized that it wasn't something I really loved to do. And in fact, I actually wasn't really good at it <laughs> and I got fired. So my first job out of college in accounting, uh, they brought me into a room, the HR person was there and they said, listen, you're not good at this. Uh, we're going to have to <laughs> let you go. Uh, and it was a revelation for me. It was like, it, it was an awakening and thank goodness, right? Like I had, and, and I thank them all the time. Actually, I see the HR person that fired me in, in conferences now. And I, and I, we always get a laugh because I thank her. It was career changing for me uh, to realize very early on that either, you know, I, I didn't like it and I wasn't good at it. So I went back to the recruiting firm that had placed me as an accountant. I said, Hey, I don't want to do this accounting stuff anymore. What, what else is out there? I had just no idea what was available. And there was, you know, in New York at the time, it was very popular to go into finance. And I was like, ah, that doesn't really excite me either. And they said, well, how about recruiting, you know, doing what we do on this side of the table? And I said, ah, why not? You know, there was really nothing, uh, nothing else really exciting me. And, and I got, I got bit, I got bit by the recruiting bug, started doing recruiting uh, for them and then jumped out and started doing recruiting for a boutique search firm. Uh, and it was during the dot-com boom in New York in you know, the mid uh, 1990s and the late uh, early 2000s and started doing HR. A lot of these dot-com companies didn't have an HR person. So uh -huh. starting started to not only recruit for them, but also like consult and do employee manuals and all these other stuff. So I kind of learned HR by doing um, and studying, of course, I, I, uh, I studied up on SHRM and the PHR and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I said, this is this is really interesting. I love doing this. I love coming into early stage companies and, and building this function and, and recruiting. And then I got uh, asked by a couple of founders of, of a company um, called, um, actually, it's uh, Savos, um, you know, come on, come on in. We'd love to have you come in as a founder. They were very early stage. And, and so not only did I get bit by the HR and recruiting bug, I got bit by the startup bug, uh, where Hi. especially in New York at that time, everyone was like, why are you going into these startups? Like, why don't you just <laughs> go work for Goldman Sachs and all these other 
I was like, I, I, I just loved the idea of working with entrepreneurs. I got excited about new things. I loved technology at the time. And it was, you know, of course, dot com and then mobile. It was really just so exciting. And that's how I got into HR. And I've been in HR, for, you know, I like to say I got my PhD in startup. Uh, and I've been doing startup HR, high growth tech companies for the last 20 plus years. I mean, that's, yeah, it's quite the story, isn't it? And it's not unusual, actually, that transition between the sort of financial side of things and the financial professions into HR. I think somebody else I was talking to the other day, I don't think I've released that episode yet, but um, that, again, was somebody who came through the finance channel and then then ended up in HR. And it was really interesting to see how that 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 kind of sways towards um, analytical thinking and the things that that can bring to a role like HR. So you, know, you think of it as being attracting the, the those that are a little bit um i guess if you go really stereotypical soft and peopley but tissues and issues <laughs> um actually one of my other guests uh, uh, kind of refers to it as pink fluff on occasions that hr can be seen as a bit pink <clears throat> and fluff. um whole other <laughs> conversation about that obviously um right. but ultimately yeah it's not an unusual actually the strengths that brings the insights the um the ability to see things from a slightly different perspective i think for a lot of people it become hugely successful it it really does, and and it you know I think accidental HR is is fairly common. I'm not sure I've, I've I haven't seen whether finance is a track for that, but it but I will tell you that it it doesn't only give you sort of the left brain right brain thinking capabilities. It also shocks the heck out of CFOs when you can talk about a balance sheet and an income statement. Like I I, I love coming into a company where I don't know the CFO. And I ask for these things and they're like, well, why do you want, you're the HR person. Why do you want to look at these? I'm like, I can actually read these. And, you know, and when you make comments about certain things and the fact that, you know, people don't sit on the balance sheet as assets, like they're very, I, I you just see their eyes widening up, widen up. And then they find out that I have an accounting and finance, you know, a finance background. So it definitely is, is helpful. And, it also it always brings you back from that you know the pink or the fluffy HR mm. to what what are you doing what programs you're running what things that you're doing and are they having business impact and if they're not why are you doing them because at the end of the day that's you know it all ladders up into the business and you know investors and stakeholders and employees and all that sort of stuff so having that kind of mind to be able to go to and it's not always easy right like a lot of the stuff we do in HR there's no really direct connection or correlation to business. Um, sometimes yeah. there is, sometimes it's, you know, softly correlated or, you know, cause this causation and other things, but, you know, there, there's a really interesting movement that's happening now, particularly in HR and SEC reporting. So uh, there's something called ISO 34, 3414, not to get all geeky and ISO numbery on you, but you can geek out. It's, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, sounds good. Then I'll, I'm going. I'm, I'm diving in. <laughs> I'm diving in. But um, it really, it's a, it's a regulation, or at least it's a, a standard HR metrics that are going to be required for reporting uh, for any company that's public or ready to file for their IPO uh, mandated by the SEC. It's not there yet. It's guidance right now, but it's about 50 HR metrics. And so I think in a, in a couple of years where this idea of being left brain, right brain in HR is going to be an absolute requirement. You're going to have to be able to pull these metrics and just for reporting sake, from a compliance perspective. But the interesting thing for me is once those metrics are reported, you can clearly see, right? You have the metrics, the financial metrics here and the HR metrics here. You can actually make a very discerning uh, argument that if these things, if HR does well, the finances do well, and people will start putting like funds together just based on your like HR metrics. Um, and so I'm really excited about that. And I and I and I love. I read a book recently called People Economics, uh, written by Laura Queen, who also is a former finance into HR, but she she went further with finance. I guess she was pretty good at it, uh, more so than I was. She's CPA, so, uh, okay. but yeah, it's uh, it's really an exciting time. Yeah, and it'd be interesting to see how that um, that trend, that, that that guidance evolves over time and, and how it, it materializes or manifests across kind of global HR network, global HR business um, in, impacts. Um, obviously an awful lot of those acronyms are US acronyms, of course they are. But at the same time, I think there's an awful lot, there was an awful lot of talk in the UK, two, three, 
four or more years ago around big data being so important in HR. And then, of course, it all went a little bit quiet on, well, that was the biggest buzzword in, say, I don't know, 2015 or something, 2014. Now it's kind of like, well, that's kind of normal, or is it? You know, some organizations are doing that super well, and other organizations just aren't touching it still. And you're right, there's elements of HR that are always going to be a little ambiguous, a little bit how long is a piece of string. A little, if you think about health and safety, you know, the amount of money health and safety initiatives must save organizations, but you can't prove that they save organizations that because you can't prove the accidents that would have happened if health and safety protocols weren't in place. Again, you can't right, prove right. the tribunals as we have here or the lawsuits as you might have there that would or wouldn't have happened if certain HR protocols weren't in place. You have to assume right. an amount of trouble, civil suits or right. So you, you kind of yeah, have to kind of factor of... in norms and, and hope for the best, I suppose. But we are going off topic and, and a that's... little bit. Yeah, so, of course. Yeah, so let's let's yeah. get back on track. <laughs> Gen Z, let's define what we mean to start with by Gen Z, because I think when we talk about millennials, boomers, Gen Z, it, it gets it can be a little bit confused. And there's a little bit of, um, I think, you know, um, blurring of the lines, but certainly between Generation X, Y and Z. Um, so let's define the meaning. And actually, what does that therefore mean for, for forward thinking HR professionals to understand that, that definition? Yeah, I mean, you know, these are so. Generation Z is is the next generation coming into the workforce. They're already in the workforce, partially a couple of years in the workforce, but in a couple of years, they're going to be 30 to 40% of the workforce. So this is the next. So if you think of the various generations, you have boomers, you have um, Gen X, which is where I sit, you had millennials, and now you have a Gen Z. And to be more prescriptive, these are folks that are born between 1997 and 2012. Um, and so when you when you think of this generation, um, one of the biggest, you know, I, I talk a lot about in my book is is trying to understand the generation. And we're, and we're starting to see, particularly in, in business, I, I say this all the time, whenever you have a, a new idea coming into any industry or any business and it challenges the status quo, what happens is it's almost like a, a virus that in, in a system that the antibodies start attacking it, right? So you're seeing this already. If you, if you Google search Gen Z, you'll, you'll see there are companies that are like, you know, these folks are entitled or are they asking for too much and all. So we're starting to see it. But, you know, for me, it's like this, first of all, there are only one or two uh, years in the workforce. Like, what do you know about them? And that was the intent of the book is to educate. Like, let me tell you, what this generation is all about. And, and so when you start in, in sort of the time frame or the time period of 97 to, to 2012, you automatically realize that the iPhone, the launch of the iPhone in 2007 was a huge impact on this generation. The, the, the fact that they are now accessing information, um, getting things almost immediately, thanks to our friends at Amazon Prime here in the US, uh, Alibaba internationally, other, we other have that too. sort of retailers. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're a global organization. You literally can pick up your, your phone and get access to any piece of information globally, you, you know, uh, arguably, and I know Twitter's going through some things right now, but, you know, you can get access to, to news and, and, and information, and then you can get anything delivered, you know, almost in the same day. This generation was born on the, you know, born with an iPhone. And I actually said that in an HR article and someone quoted me literally that like they were born with an iPhone. So of course I created a meme with a baby having an iPhone. <laughs> next to them. Um, I said, okay, reporter. Like the phones not, are available. You know. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But you're exactly. right. I mean, Apple did start that revolution because other phones have effectively replicated what the iPhone did. And yes, you've got right, these two exactly. tools, Android or, or iOS, but actually also the operational, the usability, the instant access to things has been the go-to, hasn't it? That has been the norm now for, and like you say, for this generation, they haven't known anything else. They haven't known, they the haven't. Old, you know, ringing, using the dialer thing where the, you know, the nine was furthest away. <laughs> it took you longer to dial 999 than it did to dial anything else, which here obviously is an emergency yeah. number, bad planning. Um, or even just the old apples, Blackberries, not the apples, sorry, the old Blackberries with the, the little text, pads or the Nokia's the early Nokia's right actual had keyboards. to press the button yep. four yep. times to get the letter you wanted you know all of those <laughs> they haven't experienced any of that evolution so they've, they're used to this the... instant stuff isn't it and ironically the last thing they do with their yeah. phone usually is actually phone anyone 
Right, right. The actual one function of a phone, right? Um, but I love your 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 BlackBerry. Um, you know, that's kind of our version of you know our parents saying they walked to school. You know, up the ways. <laughs> right. You know, so we used to have to press our buttons. In my four day, times. <laughs> four times. You you folks are so lucky. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think you know if you think how that plays out, right? So first of all, I mean, iPhone is a thing. Two thirds of this generation actually own an iPhone. So they prefer the iPhone over Android and, and Google. Um, and, and that says a lot, right? If you unpack that alone, it's about design, right? It's about UX and ease of use, it's, you know, something, things that Apple really focus on is this, you know, is of course, the, you, if you ever opened up an Apple product, it's beautifully designed, it's, everything is intentional. So that's really important to this generation is the ease of use. And I remember, I, you know, I have three teenage kids, they're all Gen Z, and I remember them being young and, you know, handing them an iPad and, and within seconds, they're figuring it out, right? So that ease of use, how does that then translate to the workforce? How does that translate in, in the book? I, call, I, I say, find, keep and elevate as the subtitle, but find is recruiting, keep is like, you know, HR operations yeah. and engagement and elevate is training. Like, how does that focus on design and ease of use kind of filter into each one of those different pillars. So really important factor. And then the ability to get anything you want and get access to anything creates an attention span that's literally, uh, you know, eight seconds. So mm -hmm. think about that. You're, you know, when you're, when you're going to go, go to your recruiting site right now, go to your career site right now in your company and, and apply for your own job and tell me whether or not it takes eight seconds. Because eight seconds, they're going to come to your website. If they're not interested, they're out, right? Or it takes longer if they have to. If it's if the process is too long or is repetitive in some way, if it's not mobile focused, um, again, this is a generation, like you said. Not only did they not know the the internet never existed, but mobile yeah. phones, right? So that that's a different element in terms of communication and patience and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, everything you do, you do through your phone. It's it's, it's, it's it, I think I know to my nephew, he's he would he would classify I think just about as he's on the cusp. Um, he's the latter end of, of Gen Z and, and obviously the beginning of, of the next one. Um, but ultimately, yeah, he's he's very much you could hand him any phone and he knows how to use it straight away. He was born into that world where mum already had uh, you know, a smartphone when he was born. Um, so that's to him completely normal. He is flabbergasted that I'm older than the Internet. He cannot believe that there was a world where the internet wasn't a thing and you couldn't get on YouTube. And, and I said, no, you know, I, I, it didn't exist when I was your age. It just wasn't there. We didn't have mobiles. I didn't have my first mobile until I was 23. <laughs> so this was, right, right. this was, this was, this is a, a totally different experience that these, these kids and these Absolutely. young kids are using. We actually went to what? the places that you're looking at <laughs> we actually yeah. had to go there yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> by the way or read I it i hadn't heard of a selfie we just took photos yeah. of stuff you know? <laughs> so i wasn't in the photos <laughs> right. i took the photos <laughs> it's like my right, phone did right. not take photos for a long time <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> i had a camera so, i mean i'm nostalgic now but and i'm not saying that was better i'm not saying that was better at all but it is, it is it's a totally different set of expectations and you're right about that attention span it's not a case they can't hold attention. They can. They, I know. I, I know he can focus if you get his attention within that time. If it's interesting enough, you can hold his attention. But if you haven't got Perfect. it in the first few seconds, you know you're kind of wasting your time with the after stuff because if you don't do it right straight up. The after stuff they wouldn't even get to. Interest right. is gone. No, it's and, too hard. I'll do it. And it's, no it's too question complex. That or you haven't done it right. It, but... Right, and the, and it's no question that platform like TikTok has accelerated so quickly. I mean, TikTok's growth, you know, I, I think recently, you know, trading or more valued than Meta or Facebook and Google, TikTok or YouTube, it is literally, you know, doubling in terms of its size year over year and just has grown quicker than Instagram because if you've ever been on TikTok, and I, I listen, I, I do these, I, I jump into these tools because, again, like you said, it's not, it wasn't better back then. In fact, I would argue it's not, it wasn't, right? The amount of information that these, these kids have, 
listen, there's a detrimental piece and we all know there's studies around Instagram and, and young girls and all that sort of stuff. But I do feel like the access, they are so much smarter, so much socially focused, so much, you know, climate focused than we were um, that they're, you know, part of that is now translating into the things that they want in an employer. Um, and it's, and it's non-negotiable for them too. So, uh, but it's, it's just fascinating that, you know, this, this attention span, you can see the mechanics of TikTok play out in that where it's literally like, you're just flipping through videos and maybe it's eight seconds, maybe it's 30 seconds or, but it's still that quick nature and it's all mobile. So, you know, it's really, really hook, good, uh, good point. Yeah, it has to have a hook. Like you won't you won't watch thirty seconds because it, it, if the first eight to ten seconds are dull as ditch water, why would right. you have? Do you know? Funny enough, actually, I find myself being shorter in my, my attention span online. I think maybe I think as a nuance are. of the, the the content that's out there, if I think so, if I just scroll through something and it doesn't grab my attention straight away, I'm like, oh, next. So I go right. almost you, you can find yourself being influenced by Gen Z, effectively. Oh, absolutely, and the and listen, TikTok is they have so many algorithms around so many, de and I think TikTok, there's a lot to learn from TikTok, arguably outside of its, you know, Chinese government control issues that we're seeing, particularly here in the U.S. But outside of that, the mechanics, what tick, one, they do a really good job of moderating, right? So if you say something that's offensive, that like you're out or you get banned or whatever it is. So they do a really good job of that. But the algorithms, I remember as a kid, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, I was literally my father's remote control. Like we didn't have remote controls. And so he'd go turn the channel. Like, you just, and and we and you would just literally well, the try to find something. The chance you were sitting this on, far away from the screen anyway, right? <laughs> on, yeah, right, right, yeah. I'm, now I'm blind because of it. But, um, <laughs> old, old wives tale. Um, but, you know, it's the algorithm in TikTok, they, it gives you exactly what you want because it learns your behaviors, right? You're you're scrolling through, are you watching this video? Are you liking it? Are you, if you swipe up quickly? So like, there's a lot to learn from those mechanics that I think are super important. And that's one of the other insights from the book is that this generation majority, male, female, binary, whatever, whatever the, the gender specification is, they're gamers too. Like yeah. they're, they're gamers. And so- and, you know, when I say that, a lot of folks are going, oh, we got to add, you know, gaming to everything we do. No, no, no. It's it's not about adding gaming. It's about thinking about the mechanics of gaming and why they're interested. And I talk a lot about Fortnite, if you're familiar um, with Fortnite. I'm, I'm, I am familiar. Very, I, have a, I have a 13 year old nephew. I'm very familiar with Fortnite. So, you know, Fortnite. So Fortnite is fascinating. And, and I didn't learn this until I talked to my son, who's a big gamer. And, you know, Fortnite is interesting. It, it, it's a six billion dollar a year industry uh, company. So you're talking about like fifty billion dollars over five years. Like this is this is like a, no one really talks about Fortnite, but it's this environment. It's first person. But the interesting thing about Fortnite is he. So we go back to Marvel put out this this thing called Moon Knight, uh, the series called Moon Knight, All right. yeah. uh, which he absolutely loved. We watched together and connected us. It was really great. And then I, I was watching him play. You know, I, I went into his room and he, he had the Fortnite character on uh, uh, garb on his character. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. You you got Fortnite. And I know he loved it. And I'm like, oh, you must have gotten all the powers that come with that. He goes, no. I'm like, wait, what What do you mean? You, you can't like fly and do. He goes, no, it's just it's just the dress it's just a skin and i'm like did you pay for that and he goes yeah i'm like well why it why wouldn't you want to level up and get all this it, its powers and he's like that's not how fortnite works it's it, you you can't have an advantage over other folks so it's it's their version of what i would call our bmws or our mercedes or you know fancy handbag like it's now this generation this skin and showing that in the virtual world was so important to him that he actually purchased it. And that, was, that skin is a $5 billion business. So when I say gamers, what are the mechanics mm. behind it? And how can we employ that in our company? And that's the thing is that if you think about it at the base level, you're talking personalization. You're talking image to a degree. You're talking maybe status. And all of them are, are basic human traits. They're just manifesting in a different way they're not manifesting in i've got a v8 uh, it might be more that it's for, for their generation it's much more cool and, and oh, that's probably the, the wrong word to use entirely so because you know i'm old and all 
um, is it is much more <laughs> cool to have uh, you know a, a Nissan Leaf or uh, a Tesla or an electric vehicle? If that's that's the car du jour, that's the thing to be seen in, or not a car at all. Actually, no, no, don't have a car. I go everywhere on my bike. I'm um, certainly in the UK. Actually, if you're in London, it's not worth owning a car in London for a lot of people because the roads are awful. It's so much you can get from one side <laughs> to London to the other on a bicycle about twice as fast as you can do it in a car. New at York certain Earth times a day obviously absolutely. it's three in the morning not the case but it's certain times a day absolutely you can get across london quicker by on foot or you know by by trains or, or tubes and so it's it, it's it's a totally different mindset but based on the same human principles that everyone else is governed by they're just applied in a different way through different media right. like gamification if you want to call it that like you know iphones tablets um, everything being wireless. Anytime, and I love that you say that because it, it's such it's such a, a great insight that helps people understand that these the the foundationally it's the same, right? We're all the same across generations. It's just a different way that it's manifesting for this generation. But the immediate reaction that we always have is like, oh, that's bad, or that's weird, or that's strange, or that's different, or whatever. In my we day, start pushing <laughs> back on that, right? Like, yeah, I mean. Uh, the, I'm I'm really excited. So so Mark Cuban here in the U.S. Um, who's also you know he does the 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 the, the show uh, Shark Tank and all these but he's a oh, pro, right, yeah, yeah. prolific entrepreneur you know very wealthy he owns an NBA team. He's been on the circuit talking about how Gen Z is going to be the best generation and I and I love that he's saying that because you know when I talk on these on these kind of uh, podcasts or I talk on on uh, webinars about Gen Z like people are like well are they asking too much and I'm like well think about what they're asking for they they want you know they want sort of uh, value creation right they they want flexibility they want your company to be socially minded they want your company to be climate change focused and uh, racial equity and all these sort of things I'm like pick one of those and please tell me which one is not good for the world, not good for, for your company. So it, it's really, I, and I love that you said that it's foundationally the same kind of things, but manifesting in a very different way. And we just need to understand what that is, as opposed to pushing back on. Absolutely. So what's the biggest opportunities then for HR to succeed in engaging this group? So bringing them in, so recruiting in the first place, so finding them, bringing them in, keeping them because you know ultimately let's let's face it we're talking you know one to two years so I saw the sort of graduates that I used to work with they would come in if they didn't see progression in two to three years they were off they were gone um you wouldn't keep them if they weren't progressing during that time or feeling challenged or feeling that real sense of purpose um and then obviously there's that the, there is that piece um around what next for them as well isn't it what can you do with them beyond that is it is it reasonable for them to say well i want to be promoted within two years or you know is that is that realistic for an organization to be able to flex in that way or not so what's what's the biggest opportunities you'd see for hr to be able to just bring them in and engage to start with and then we can talk about the retention piece sure uh, absolutely i mean i think it, before i even sort of go into the more tactical pieces the why is important, right? The why, why would an HR person need to do this? And I will tell you that one, that's a generation coming into the workforce, you have no choice. We were kind of all surprised <laughs> when millennials came in and we we're like, oh, well, they want you're something stuck with, different. So you might as well get used to them, right? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You, you, you know, They're like coming. first to understand, right? Uh, let's try to understand them. I will also say that, you know, there, I've been, I read a book recently, the beginning, um, Get the name. Uh, the The end of the world is just the beginning. Written by Peter Zion, and he talks about the demographic changes that are happening across the world, and the fact that there's a lot of countries and a and a lot of areas that don't have sort of younger populations coming in. So the more you're going to learn about this generation, the more strategically advantaged you're going to be as a country, as a as a company. And we're starting, and there, you know, it it is a very scary book, by the way. Please read it. Um, it's super important, but it's so scary. It talks about the demographic collapse of certain countries because of you just don't have younger generations coming in. Older generations are retiring, so you don't have the consumption and you don't have the production. So it's like what happens from an economic perspective. So it's very scary um, in some in some places. Um, but again, you could look at this as a competitive advantage. If you're really solidifying your approach to attract, retaining, and training this generation, it becomes a business advantage. So that's the why. The how, 
little bit more complex and nuanced, right? So I think the advantages here are really thinking through what what this, the interesting thing is this generation also has not seen the economic changes as adults. They've seen economic crashes 2008, you know, 2020 with COVID, they've seen it through their parents' eyes, but they haven't seen it directly. So from a talent perspective, they still have leverage. And even today, right, if you look at the amount of open jobs to the amount of people, and given, you know, Peter Zion's predictions of less and less younger people, they're going to become, you know, aside from any recession that we're potentially looking at in the next couple of months, they're going to have this advantage and, and talent leverage is that leverage is going to be in the talent market again. So you have to prepare your organization to, to, to do the things we're talking about, which these are hard, like what's your social focus, right? What is your climate? What's your stance on climate change? Because this generation, what's going to happen is because they have access to information and it's mobile, they're going to do their research. And so you'll never know that they were not interested or interested in your company because they're never going to apply to your job. So how are you fundamentally, from a front end perspective, perpetuating your organization alongside these different things like social, social, uh, you know, um, uh, equity, income equity, climate change, all these sort of things, racial, you know, they want, they want to make sure you have a diverse, this generation will look at your LinkedIn, you say you're diverse, but when they look at your LinkedIn, none of your board members are from underrepresented groups, none of your leaders, they're not even going to apply. So you have to take, I think, when I talk about find, keep and elevate, it's kind of the employee journey, mm. start with find, <laughs> Make That's sure a and start even woman, before it? then. Yeah, that is a hidden talent. Absolutely, and not Take even it. applying because they're ruling you out because you're not putting that stuff out in the world. And I guess if you think right. about organisations like, and I, I know uh, obviously Dan Price has done an awful lot with the kind of socioeconomic financial gains for his his staff. He's got you know queues of people wanting to work with him. Um, but also you think about companies like Patagonia, I mean, amazing stance to take on, on uh, both on the product, but also on the, uh, the organization now that's, that's just, just shifted massively and a huge jump for an organization like that to take. So I would imagine, well, I'm not, I don't know for sure, but I would imagine he's got an awful lot of people uh, interested in working with Patagonia because of that stance, the, the climate stance and the socioeconomic um it's responsibility and uh, we call it csr it's a corporate social responsibility and i know it's the same right. where you are ESG. that's what it's about and it is a measure it's a measure that organizations can take but it's not mandated for it's not not you know it's not you have to but it's recognized no. particularly by this generation that we're talking about today that that actually is vital to an organization being seen as sustainable seen as a future-proofed organization future conscious of you know what's happening with the world and all the rest of it um, but we're, we're also seeing shifts in in finance and economics, you know, shares and, and investments and people voting with their feet in terms of banking and stuff. Are those banks that support, say, you know, um, fossil fuels and, and the likes of Shell and Encon and all the rest. It's still going. It's not, is it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Shell, BP and all those. Um, yeah. But also, you know, then going off to, to to different banks even because they don't want to bank with an organization that has funds in those all right and it, it's not just about employment is it i suppose there's one thing we're talking a lot here about what hr and organization can and should do for gen z to bring them in to find them to, to to evolve them let's have a look at it from hr and the organization's perspective what do they get from gen z what does gen z bring to the party um yeah i mean i think like you said in, in terms of your point around tiktok or content you get their attention right i think you Gen Z is is interesting. If you look at Gen Z and their parents, mostly raised for to a degree, and I'm generalizing by Generation X, uh, and Generation X has been one of the most loyal generations. Not because I'm part of it, but um, research has shown that is they're very loyal, right? But they also, you know, I remember times where I really it didn't really I never thought about like a company's social good or climate change. Um, so you know, we having brought up a lot of the Gen Z, loyalty is a key factor. So you get their loyalty, which to me translates into so many different, you know, we talk about the soft and the, and the hard correlations to, to business results. Loyalty is actually proven to show that, you know, under engagement, if you look at loyalty, 
that there's a direct impact to business results. That if you can get someone loyal to your organization, they're going to not only, you know, I, I say they provide their hands, heart, and their and their mind to you, um, and they'll be committed to you, right? And and they're going to be uh, the folks that, you know, from a retention perspective, are the ones that stay. But you have to click in an authentic way on all of these things, right? They're they're non-negotiable for this generation. But you will get that loyalty. You get the creativity. This is a generation that has is so well informed because of the internet and the mobile uh, aspect of their lives that you're you're going to get their creativity their innovation their loyalty their hands their heart and their and their minds and to me that is invaluable especially if you think about over the past i would say 4 to 5 decades if you look at the s&p value or the value of the s&p 500 it's gone from tangibles, which are like, you know, cars and furniture and chairs and all sorts of things to now uh, 90% or 95% plus intangible. So this is, this that's human capital. That mm -hmm. is your software, your IP. And it's so funny when I talk about, when I ask managers or leaders, you know, what makes up a company's value? They, you know, they say, of course, people, um, software and IP. And I'm like, okay, great where do you think that software and IP comes from? Well, that's people. People are writing the code, right? So, you know, I would argue almost 100% of company value is people. So this is going to be incredibly important for you to basically get, retain, engage, and, and, and have this generation productive in your workforce. It will be a competitive advantage. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So this just popped to my mind when you were talking then around um, where, where we are with with. Gen Z coming through and I just in my head I'm like okay so we're I'm I'm on the cusp I think between Gen X and millennial I don't think I'm quite a millennial I'd like to be but I'm a little bit too old for that um ultimately we're in that if generationally if, if we're in that space who are we to be telling people about Gen Z I suppose that's the question and I suppose my, my question to you when you were researching your book where did you get the source of your information what where did most of your information come from when you were researching that yeah, it's a great, it's a, it's a great point. I mean, I think, you know, having the experience and, and being in HR and operating in HR gives me that validity to, to look at this, but yeah, the research we did, I mean, we read, read a whole bunch of books. I said 20 plus different books on the future of work. We talked to Gen Z folks. Um, we've done some research on it. We've talked to some influencer in, in Gen Z. We even sent a couple of drafts of the book to uh, Gen Z influencers just to be like, hey, do we do we get this right? You know, from your perspective, and and it's interesting because most of them, if not all of them, came back and said, yeah, this is this feels right. I feel like you're you're telling our story um, in a very unique way. So having you know, could a Gen Z person have written this book? Yes, but they have no basis of experience in companies to say, okay, this is you know, it would just be looked at as another sort of virus coming into the system and everyone attacking oh look this gen z person where it's like here's your here's someone that's that's similar to you in business they you know here's a leader in a software business saying hey you got to be prepared like this generation is coming in and and this is what they're looking for but yeah we we validated it we talked to a bunch of gen z we talked to gen z influencers send the book out um uh, the pre-read and we got really great free feedback and and we're now extending likely into other things like putting together round tables so we can connect, you know, current leaders of companies to Gen Z to have a discussion, right? Because I, I think that the book creates understanding and empathy and, and instructs folks how to think about these things. But the conversation to me is going to be really, really important. I think that's the next phase of, of what I'd like to accomplish with this. Yeah, I like that. And it almost sounds like almost a, this sort of round table almost sounds like sort of generational mentoring. And it's not about the older generation mentoring the younger. It's actually the younger coming through and saying, actually, this is this is what's needed now. This is what we focus on, the, the purpose we want to get behind. Do you have a purpose we can get behind? Because if that's not clear, well, bye. Um, that's quite an interesting prospect, isn't it? So indulge me for a second, just um, I'll just put my coaching hat on. What role do you think coaching has for both? Gen Z themselves coming into the, the workforce now and then getting into that that multi-generational work. Let's face it, you know, you are talking about multi-generational workplaces because I don't know about where you are, but certainly here, the retirement age keeps getting extended, but also people just aren't retiring. There are people that will work long into their 70s and potentially 80s. 
Um, so coaching for them and, and those, those maybe the HR professionals who fall into these other generational categories, what sort of role would coaching play in that space? What have you seen or heard or experienced there? Sure. And it's a great, it's a great point. And that's actually the evolution of this is, is really thinking purely out of out, just outside of Gen Z to multi-generational kind of uh, thought process, right? Like that's where, you know, version 2.0 of, of these discussions is to really help figure out, okay, what is, you know, for the first time we have four different generations Alpha comes in right after that's five generations in the workforce, assuming, like you said, people work into their eighties. And I, I think I'm one of them probably. I don't think I'll ever retire. Uh, I just don't have, I, I need to be doing something. Um, but the, the coaches I think is pivotal, right? But it's understanding each generation, right? And understanding two things of each generation. One is what makes each generation different and what we just talked about, like how did these things manifest into behaviors and, 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 and to come at it without a judgment. That's another thing. Like all the generations, listen, we're, I think every generation after judges the generation before and we're, <laughs> be, you know, Xers are better than boomers and Gen Z is the greatest generation, but there are components of each generation, like you said before, that are very, very similar. What are those commonalities and figuring out how to relate those commonalities? Like, yeah, you know what? The idea of social good, that boomer had the same thing. Uh, same focus when when she was marching on Washington, you know, during, you know, wars or whatever it was, or maybe they weren't, whatever it was. It's really understanding the commonalities of every generation and trying to see how to work within those and how to work with each generation. And I think that is an important factor to, but understanding is the first part. Like, I don't think you can work. This is why at Suzy, we do a lot of education, um, particularly around uh, underrepresented groups, uh, where we just, we create empathy. We tell, we have people that come in and tell stories because you have to relate, you have to, you know, create sympathy and empathy and understand it. There's a, there's something in, in, in diversity and inclusion called mirrors, um, mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. And the concept is mirror, like, look at yourself. Why are you who you are and how are you different? And what are your different aspects? You know, what makes you different? you know, windows are looking through and seeing how someone else is different in their life and then sliding glass doors, like inviting you into their world, right? So I think it's important to have a mirror window and sliding glass door kind of framework to think about the generations. So understanding the generations, understanding the nuances, the similarities, and then coaching people to say, you know, and, and hey, this, this person, this is how they're, you know, and don't, it's not like, oh, that's a boomer. So you have to do the X, Y, and Z. It's like, no, this person, this is what they're focused on. This is what their experience are. Now it'll create, okay, now I know how they think. I know what they're, you know, what they're doing. I get, you know, and the same thing for older generations, for the younger ones, instead of like attacking it like a virus, understand, like maybe jump on TikTok and understand, like, I I get lost in TikTok. <laughs> I do. I mean, like I find myself, I go on, next thing you know, it's a 30 minutes later and I'm, you know, watching some some video. It's just like you get lost in that sort of thing. So tr really trying to create understanding, I think, is is the culture's role and then understanding those similarities and then the differences and how do we manifest that in the workforce. Yeah, so actually you've reminded me of something I thought earlier that you were talking about um, the access, obviously, that, that everyone has. It's not just Gen Z that has this access to information, you know, through smartphones and like we've all got that now. Let's face it, some of us use it more than others. Um, but there is an element there, isn't there, of of encouraging that critical thinking, encouraging that, you know, just because it's online doesn't mean it's true. Um, but it's the same principle, isn't it, across these generational um, groups within an organization. Just because you've judged that or perceived that or heard that about a generation doesn't mean it's true. So how can you use critical thinking and curiosity to to ask, to understand, to seek to to know more? without having those biases and being um you know absolutely convinced because you read it from somebody who influenced you online you really like therefore it must be true and they must be right and then the bias filters go up and everything i see after that will confirm everything i think i know and let's say that's quite a dangerous mindset to be in and that happens across all generations that's not a gen z thing that is everywhere in every human potentially that the bias can always be there 
But I suppose when it is, it's, it's this group, it's almost this tribal thing is that I am like them. They're not like me. You know, they are like me. They're Correct. not like me and so on and so forth. So what, how can you find those correlations? Say, okay, where are you like me? Oh yeah, actually we do have a shared sense of purpose. We do have a shared like of something specific or an interest in something, but you won't know until you start having those conversations. So Absolutely. somebody's coming into, someone's coming into HR um, as a new, you know, a new fresh faced entry to the HR profession, um, who let's face it may well be um, Gen Z themselves. Um, what advice would you have for them about this kind of intergenerational um, collaborative collection, um, what do you call them, the grouping that you will have in let's say five mm -hmm. generations in one organization potentially. What would be your kind of number one bit of advice to give them? Learn, learn about them, be curious. Like, and I think you hit it on the head. We, we actually, so at Suzy, we're a market research platform. We're actually using our platform to conduct a segmentation analysis around employees, not our own employees, but generally in our, in our community of, of U.S. specific consumers to identify the needs and wants and the motivating factors through segmentation, through statistical analysis. And what we found is generationally, there are similarities with each generation in terms of they, you know, comp compensation is number one. We know that, but I will tell you with certain validity and, and mathematical um, proof um, outside of my accounting degree that uh, that compensation is the number one factor for everyone. And that is not generational at all. So there, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's learning about these, these generations, finding out who they are, but also like learning about the individuals too. like try to do, you know, so we, at, at, in the market research space, there's something called quantum qual, right? So quant is all the math. It's the algorithms. It's, it's all the statistics, right? And you get to a certain insight. And then the qual is actually going <laughs> to the person and doing live interviews and getting their story. And, and it, does it validate the, the quantitative information you got? So using that kind of, you know, like be like a scientist, be curious about each generation, try to get some data, do some research on them, and then go and talk to them and say, all right, is this is this true? Like, does this person, what motivates them? Um, and then to me, that is the number one thing. And then how you execute on that is is going to depend on where you are and what you do. But you ask me for one thing, it's, it's, it's learn and research each generation, get to the human elements of it and, and know more. Like, don't, this is super important. Like anything new, all of us jump to a book or, you know, try to learn it for some reason, in HR, which is fascinating to me, we haven't done that, right? We just caught it. We kind of just jumped in and assumed certain things. So for me, education, learn, and be curious about each generation. Yeah, I love that. I thought that's really great. And funnily enough, um, <laughs> it's, I get these, I get these images in my head when when people are talking. Sometimes, and while you were talking, actually, things kind of, actually we were talking about purpose. We were talking about needs and, and being curious and finding out where the similarities are. And it's, it feels really simplistic to come back to Maslow again, but ultimately we are talking about, you know, the, not so much food and shelter, assuming assuming those basic needs are met. We're talking psychological safety, aren't we? We're talking that sense of purpose, that sense of meaning and belonging. We're talking about mastery and feeling, you know, capable and, 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 and good in the space that we do. And I know there's memes where somebody's written across the bottom of it next to food and shelter, Wi-Fi. Yes, OK, that possibly is something <laughs> else we need to add in there. Um, because right. you just in can't live house, without definitely. that, right? <laughs> exactly. Your kids will absolutely you know, be be healthy. Wi-Fi today. goes down it's here. Wi it's it becomes the um, it, it bec who has the conch, and uh, you know who has the hot spot, and you become yeah. very popular and powerful. <laughs> And the Wi-Fi always, goes down. So it's always the ultimate power parents have. I will turn that off. <laughs> I will right, right. The yeah. off. It becomes Lord of the Flies. Like, all right, who the has the Wi-Fi? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Lord of, the book, Lord of the Wi-Fi. I like flies. that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Next textbook title. You can have that one for free. <laughs> Um, so last thing before we, before we kind of um, get into it, because I will I will give an option to give a shameless plug to the book that absolutely has to happen before we finish. I mean, we just we touched on um, you know Generation Alpha. I know Mark McCrindle pointed that a little while ago. Um, just give it a name because we know they're coming. We know you know born or post twenty ten. So in theory, coming into the workforce in like four to six years, depending on which country you're in and the sort of school systems and, and the norms in terms of when when kids enter the workforce or you know, young adults enter the workforce. So how far out should we be anticipating preparing for them? Um, 
a good question. I, I, you know, we're, we're two years into Gen Z and we're, we're just having discussions now. Um, I, you know, someone had asked me like, as I was talking through how I wanted to think about my thought leadership and, and my exposure around Gen Z. And they asked me like, are you, is it too late or too early? And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I feel like it's too early still. Like it's, they're not fully in the generation. Uh, but I also feel like it's never too early. So it's kind of like, I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth here, but um, I think this before they, you know, once they're in college and we know that it's inevitable, they're coming into the space. It's a year or two prior to that, to really understand, do some research and be prepared. I mean, I, to me, it just makes sense. We've been laggers on this. And again, I, I think it's, it should be a mandatory study guide in any HR college course to think about generations within organizations. Um, so I think early on, I think we have to be very early on on this uh, before people join in the workforce, because then you're trial by fire, <laughs> you know, like, well, if you think about like, it, oh, yeah. wait, they want something different. Yeah. If I think about it now, it, it, if I think about sort of 12, 13 year olds now in, in secondary school, as we call it here, um, are starting to have careers conversations. They are starting to choose the exams that they're going to do for the for their GCSEs, which is their, their sort of sixteen year old exams, and then what they're going to do for their A levels, which is their sixteen to eighteen year old kind of exams, mm -hmm. and then what they're going to study at university. They're starting to think about that stuff, so they're they're, they're considering the world of work. So I don't think it would hurt for HR teams and HR professionals and Gen Z HR professionals who will be more senior by the time these kids come through. Is looking at doing that gentle horizon scan to say, okay, so who's coming? What's coming? How are they learning? And let's keep an eye on the school system. What is the school system teaching now that they're going to bring with them? What's the what's the higher education um, platform starting to explore and launch and look like that's going to then knock on um, to the world of, of business and organizations in the future, as well as obviously all of the normal pestle stuff that we do sure. in looking at the kind of environment, environmental and economic um environments that are going to be you know, potentially in the future we can't we don't have a crystal ball yeah. but we do have some visibility to a degree make some educated guesses about what what folk are going to want and need as a build on i think yeah. to what will become normal to gen z and we know they're coming and right? helping like, gen no, z understand that they're, they're going to no have surprise. the same biases as gen x does about we gen know z there's another <laughs> there's another generation coming like they, like I, we were surprised about millennials right so to answer your question more succinctly i think it's before they join the workforce like we should be preparing for this generation to come in um but we're again it's it's interesting and you have me thinking about this how we don't in so many other areas we prepare but in this area we just don't prepare as generations come in and it's not I would argue that if I looked at every HR course that's out there and at the college level, that there isn't this generation study uh, and and maybe there should be. Um, but very yeah, curious, I think actually, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm very curious about that. Funny enough, actually, if anyone's listening to this and actually you're, you're in the middle of your CIPD training, which for us is the uh, uh, Institute of Personal SPHR. Development, basically is, yeah. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's our accreditating body. Um, look, you don't have to accredit with them to be an HR professional here, but you know, some people, it, choose to do that um ultimately if anyone's doing that training or they're doing a an, an degree in human resource management or a, a master's in human resource management at all get in touch and let me know is there anything in your um, prospectus you're in your curriculum that says anything about generational management generational organizational development um and what's coming that future focus on on the generational question. I mean, because that'd be a fascinating thing to think about. And if you want to be on the podcast, let me know, because again, that would be a fascinating thing to talk about and very useful for folks in HR. So Anthony, the shameless plug for the book, because it sounds fantastic. I'm going to have to read it. I must admit, <laughs> it's like I really probably should have before we did this, but I think we were quite short on time because we only arranged it, what, a fortnight ago? Um, so how can folk, A, find your book, B, find you and or connect with you? Sure, and I and really appreciate the the shameless uh, plug, and also oh, like plug. if you do get a bunch of folks identifying a gap in the generational piece, it sounds like a good college professor opportunity for me. So uh, let me know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, get tenure. Uh, 
So yeah, so people, it's the the new employee contract, how to find, keep, uh, and elevate Gen Z talent. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, uh, mostly on Amazon. Uh, it's pretty quick read. Uh, it provides really a you know high level macro view of of what I call the employee contract, which is eroded over the decades, and 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 then in the light of you know how do we uh, recruit, uh, engage, and, and train uh, Gen Z. For me, anthonyonesto.com or LinkedIn, you can find me there. Happy to connect with anyone. I'm an open networker, so please reach out. I'm happy to connect with folks and uh, and provide more details. And and I've actually open sourced pieces of the insights from the book on my LinkedIn profile, so you can see it there. And there's a 20 plus page slide deck that you can uh, get for free. So, wow, more. that that is fantastic. What we'll, I will make sure to do is pop all of your social connections, contacts, links and stuff, as well as a link to, as long as it's Amazon UK, I can send, I can put a link there as well, as well as Amazon.com. Um, is it Kindle as well, the book? I believe so. I think it's okay. now out on Kindle. We're working on um, potentially an audio book too at some point. Brilliant. That's really good to know. So any any links that we've got, we will pop in the show notes so you can click them really easily and connect with Anthony. Great. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for your guest, Anthony. You've been fascinating. I've really enjoyed this one. Um, I don't enjoy all of them, but I just, I find it actually, it was a bit nostalgic as well. I, I do like a bit of nostalgia every now and again. <laughs> Ash back to the old phones. Anyway, um, so thank, thank you for listening, over. folks. Um, if you liked this, please subscribe on whatever platform you happen to be listening from. Um, if you want to get in touch with myself, you know where I am. My contacts are all on the show notes anyway, and Anthony's will be too. So do connect with him. Have a look, check out the book and see what you think. And tell us, tell us what you think. Thanks again, Anthony. This has been fantastic. And I will say thank good you for now.